What a beautiful start to this Christmas celebration, amen? amen? We will be in Isaiah chapter 9, and Amy Curtis is going to be our scripture reader this morning. How are you this morning, Amy? Good. Great. All right. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it. And to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that it's not just for holidays, it's, it's for every day of our life. And so, Father, we need your help to understand it. I pray that you'd be with me as I, I teach it. I pray that uh, our hearts would be open, our minds would be clear, and that our wills would be ready to be changed, and we could be more like the Savior who was born that we're celebrating. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, this gentleman here is Dan Andre. I've known Dan for a long time. Uh, about 30 years, and uh, he is like the complete package of people, human beings I've ever met. You ever met somebody who's good at like everything, like literally everything? Dan Andre can sing, sing really well. He could preach, I mean, super evangelist, traveled the world preaching in all different places. He was a chalk artist. He was known for drawing a picture while he was preaching, and how you do that, I mean, I can't hardly preach, let alone draw a beautiful picture, and he could do the picture in like 15 minutes, and it looked like, wow, that would have taken me weeks, and he could paint. He was a web designer. He uh, was very technical on computers. He knew his Bible extremely well. He wrote books. He, um, he designed uh, not only web pages for uh, other churches, he also ran sound. Like, he came in when I was pastor at First Baptist Church of Clute, we had a really humongous auditorium that said about 900, but we could never get the sound right. Kept having echoes and squeals and all kinds of things. And he came in and one afternoon fixed our sound. It's just like there was nothing this guy could do except for one thing. He wasn't good at sports. But that was only because he had partial paralysis in his right hand. He, he mostly drew left-handed, even though he was born right-handed, but he had an accident that paralyzed his right hand. And he's still alive today. I messaged him the other day just to see how he was doing. But he was like the most well-rounded person. And in spite of all those talents, he was humble. Like he wouldn't brag about himself. He, would, he, he was just really humble. And what was really weird is I brought him in to do a youth camp because I had heard about him. And we met and we got to talking. He said, where'd you grow up? I said, I grew up in Newark, Delaware. And he said, really? He said, I went to church in Newark, Delaware. I said, I said really, what church? He said, Newark Baptist Church. I said, that's the church I got saved in. He's like, no, you're making this up. And like, We'd actually gone to the same church at different times in our life, and it was really fascinating. But like I said, he's not perfect, but he was the most well-rounded person I think I've ever met in my life. But when it comes to the birth of Christ, this was the full package. (laughs) Jesus really did, was perfect in every area of life. I don't think he showed off his talents. I don't think he like did gymnastics as one-year-old or anything like that. I think he grew up in a natural way, but we know that he knew everything, he could do anything, Any limitations were those he put on himself by taking on human flesh. And that's the Savior you're going to want to talk about here this morning. And and Isaiah, what's interesting about Isaiah is it's the largest book in the Bible. A good way to remember it, the number of chapters, is it's the same number of books in the Bible. How many books are in the Bible? 
66. So that's the number of chapters. In fact, it's interesting that Isaiah, as big as it is, is like a microcosm of all the scriptures. It's interesting how that worked out that way. But let me just give you some interesting facts about Isaiah because he has more prophecies about Jesus than any other. We could spend years and years in the book of Isaiah. Um, first of all, he prophesied that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, something that has never happened prior and never happened since. And it was fulfilled about 600 years later in Luke chapter 1. He prophesied that he would preach in Galilee, and that would be his main area of ministry. And of course, Matthew documents the travels of Jesus, and so does history and archaeology. He prophesied that he would be an heir to the throne of David. And, uh, and of course, that was fulfilled by Jesus' genealogy, showing both Mary and Joseph being traced back, back to as ancestors of David. That's historical record. He would have his way prepared by someone. Who was that someone? John the Baptist. We know that was fulfilled. That he would be spat upon and he would be struck. And of course, that was fulfilled. All these details, again, hundreds of years in advance. And somebody would say, well, you're just trusting the Bible on that. Um, the, uh, the, the uh, what are they called? The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And they found scrolls that were written 100 years before Jesus. Okay? They, they, I'm sorry, they were the copies were 100 years before Jesus. Isaiah originally wrote almost 660 years before Jesus. But we even have historical evidence of these things being found and all these prophecies being predicted. Um, Isaiah said that he would be exalted. Of course, Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus was exalted to the right hand of the throne of God. Isaiah predicted how he would be so disfigured by the beating that he would not even be recognized as human. And Mark 15 details the torture that he endured. Isaiah talks about how this will be a blood atonement, and that would be make us at one with God. And 1 Peter talks about that in detail. But it also talks about that even though he'd be the Messiah, he'd be widely rejected by most of the Jews. And of course, that came true. And that he would bear our sins and sorrows, and that the Gentiles would seek him, uh, that he would stand silent before his, his accusers like a lamb before uh, the shears. And that he would die with transgressors who was crucified on either side of Jesus. Two thieves, right? And that uh, he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. I mean, these are super specific details. These aren't some vague Nostradamus predictions. These are hyper specific. And every single one of them came true. In fact, there's not any one that came untrue that was like false or inaccurate. So he says two th interesting statements. And he's using... Hebrew parallelism, where you say the same thing twice, but they kind of comment on one another. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the key to understanding these two phrases is the two verbs, born and given. A child is born, in other words, a birth took place. This is talking about the humanity of Jesus, that Jesus was 100% human. He was born of the seed of a woman, not of a man. Therefore, he did not have a sin nature. But it says, unto us a son is given. This is different than born. One is referring to his humanity. The other is referring to deity. That God the Father gave the Son to planet Earth to be the Savior of the world. So it happened in a physical way and it happened in a divine way. And these are talking about the, the, his humanity and his deity all at the same time. And then it says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. I thought it was interesting this morning when the kids are signing Silent Night. The word for Christ and Lord is this. And it, it's a picture of how kings wear a robe on, over one shoulder. And that's, that means the mantle of the government is upon them. That the, there's, it's a heavy burden upon your shoulders, but kings would often do that. Caesar was known for wearing something over one shoulder and tied on the other. And so you, it's a picture of that Christ will be the ultimate king, the king of the earth, and the government up, would be upon him. He would wear this robe of righteousness over his shoulders. And then it says, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it doesn't mean all these are his names. Some of you have multiple names. Anybody have like two or three first, more than one middle name? Some of y'all have that, right? Um, this is not what it's talking about when it's his name. It's talking about his authority. He will go under all these titles of his authority. And usually in the, the song, Handles Messiah, we sing Wonderful, Comma, Counselor, the Mighty God. There really should be no com comma between wonderful and counselor. If you see the pattern there, it's adjective noun, adjective noun, adjective noun, okay? 
um, it, wonderful is describing what kind of counselor he would be. And you see these four titles. It's interesting, you think about what's in a name. It, it, I like to study names, and I like to know what they mean. The top uh, names in 2023 for boys, number three came in at Oliver. Number two, Liam, which was last year's number one. Anybody want to guess what number one name of this year was, Babies Born? Anybody take a shot? Israel, that's a good guess. It was on the list of top ten. Number one was Noah, which is pretty cool. Bible name made number one. Let's look at the girls' side. Uh, Amelia and Emma. Anybody want to guess what number one was? Grace would have been good, but it's, it's similar to Oliver. It's Olivia. That's the number one name given to baby girls this week. Well, Jesus was given all these wonderful names, and the first of which is Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. And um, let's talk about, first of all, the word wonderful. We use the word wonderful to describe everything from that was a wonderful Christmas dinner to what a wonderful movie, and it's a wonderful life, all these things. But here, the word wonderful means, I wonder how that happened. Like, what? What just happened? When something miraculous happens and it leaves you scratching your head, like, I wonder how that happened. That's what it means here. It's a miraculous counselor. He, he performs, remember in the New Testament, you see the phrase over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus performing signs and wonders, okay? So that's what you need to think of when you think of wonderful counselor, that it's a miraculous counselor. First of all, his word is wonderful. It's, it's, he has a wonderful word. Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet. I can see where I'm at, and it's a light to my path. It helps me see where I'm going in life. And if you want to go somewhere in life, first of all, you have to figure out where am I at, right? If you ever get lost in downtown Houston, you want to figure out where am I at, that'll help me figure out where I'm going. And the word of God does that, and it does that in miraculous ways. It does it in a wonderful way. And, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 says, all, all Scripture, verse 16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Some translations say instruction in righteousness. That the man of God or woman of God may be complete or mature, equipped for every good work. Now I want you to notice the four things that Scripture does for us and the way that it counsels us. First of all, it's teaching. That's doctrine. What you know about Jesus Christ. That's important. That's why it's first. A lot of people, when they think of doctrine, they think, well, that's boring, whatever it may be. But it's so that you can get to know your Savior better so that you can become more like Him. Doctrine is super important. Understanding the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the resurrection, all these things, they sound like big terminology, but understanding them is the key to becoming more Christ-like. And then it moves to reproof. Here's what we know about Jesus, and here's how you're not like him. <laughs> reproof is like you're doing this wrong, and you're doing that wrong, and here's where your, where your flaws are. So when we hold up the mirror of Christ, we look at ourselves and go, wow, I am nothing like that. And that's the reproof. It tells us what's wrong with us. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. But if you want to get better, you have to know where you are, right? You have to know what you're doing wrong. And that leads to training. Now, here's how... We can train you to do what's right. And, and then correction is how you can fix what's wrong with you. Let me see here. There you go. And then you can be more like Jesus. See how it comes full circle there. The more that you, you learn about Christ, the more you see what's wrong with you. But if you train yourself properly, you can make corrections in your life and be more like Jesus Christ. Now we see his word is wonderful. It's his will is wonderful. This is the most common question that pastors get. How can I know what's God's will for my life? Should I marry this person? Should I marry that person? Should I go this career path or this career path? Which college should I attend? God's will. And the more you know God's will, the more you realize that God's will is miraculous. Um, I don't think I'm giving it away, but Michaela got accepted at uh, Wheaton College in Illinois. And... It, and uh, this family has been praying for God's will. And I'm not going to say much more about it, okay? In fact, Eugene, some Sunday soon, is going to give you, you got together the details. This the miraculous things that God did to make that all happen. And I, that's all I'll say about that. But discovering his miraculous will, how that God has a plan for you, and he makes things fall in the line. You're like, wow, 
How did that happen? It must have been God. And God says in Psalm 143, teach me to do your will for you are my God. And when we follow God's will, you will see God's miracles happen in your life. You'll see things that like, how did God know? How did God arrange this person to be there at that time and, and these things to happen and the phone ring at that exact same time? All these things fall into place. I think of years ago when we didn't, when Isaiah and Caitlin were just a newborn and a toddler and, and we were praying that they were in a really bad situation, drugs involved and all kinds of things like that. And we were praying that God would just not just make us guardians, but give us custody of them. And I t- tell you what, it, all the miracles happened. It just so mu- I went down to Brazoria County to talk to someone about how do I file paperwork to make all this stuff happen. And they said, well, you probably ought to talk to the judge, but she doesn't come in on Tuesdays. And guess who just walked in the door? The judge, who is never there on Tuesdays. The lady's telling me I'm going to have to come back. And the judge not only comes in, but she gives me about 45 minutes of free legal advice on how I can get all this done. Do you think that was a mistake? You know, and then I could just go on for an hour of all the other things that happened to where the parents signed over custody or guardianship, and then the judge gave us custody, all that stuff, and then here they are. That wasn't just an accident. That was miraculous, how God's wonderful will took place and how it happened. We also see his wonderful Holy Spirit. In Psalm 143, that same verse about your will says, let your good spirit lead me on level ground. How not only knowing the will of God, but the Holy Spirit making the will of God happen makes our path straight and he leads us on that path. And you following the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. So important. Jesus said, how many of you, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Or if they ask for a piece of bread, would give him a rock? I mean, none of you would do that, right? That's what Jesus is saying. He said, well, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And God wants us to ask, Holy Spirit, please lead us, guide us through every step, through every, make for the little decisions and the big ones, that the Holy Spirit would be our guide. And then that brings us to the, the fourth thing, his wonderful church, his wonderful church. Romans 15, 14, he says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourself are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Some translations say it this way, competent to counsel one another. I'm not against therapists. I'm not against counselors, things like that. They have a place. But let me tell you, your first place of getting advice is right here. Not, not just right here, but right here. I'll, I'll look amongst you. Finding godly women, finding godly men, to ask their opinion, ask their advice. You shouldn't make any major decision without consulting your church family. We're not trying, it's not like a cult trying to control you or whatever. It's like Proverbs says, in a multitude of counselors, there's what? There's safety. Get some advice. Talk to your brothers and sisters. I remember when we when, when I drove through deep water up in College Station, it, they totaled the vehicle. And I called Eugene and said, hey, I don't know if you know anything about cars, but I just want you to pray for me of, about making a good car decision. And I used to sell cars, so I know a bit about cars, but I just wanted to get some godly counsel. And I talked to a few people. And you know, Eugene sent me an, the perfect link to the perfect thing that led to the perfect car. And, and Tammy loves that car, Eugene. <laughs> you, know, you, you, can, t- t- you can give Tammy a hug afterwards. She'll thank you again for that car. Um, but what would have happened if I said, oh, I know more than, about cars than Eugene does. Why do I need to ask him? In a multitude of counselors, there's safety. And we need to get advice from one another. I remember one time, one of my family members was in love, <laughs> you know, and I was just a young teen- teenager. And uh, my whole family did basically what was an intervention before they were called interventions. And we just sat her down and said, hey, this guy's a loser. You do not want to be married to him. You have nothing in common with him, blah, 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 blah. No, but I love him, blah, blah, and all the tears flowing. And so she married him anyway, even though everybody in the family said, don't do it. And of course, a few years later, divorce. And I, I was wrong, you know. And that, those kind of things happen, but we need to listen to the advice of one another. That's why God gives us an amazing church family. So if you look at these four things, he, we have his wonderful word, miraculous word, his wonderful will, his, the wonderful Holy Spirit, and a wonderful church and, and I remember when I was a kid, something that was new, it was called quadraphonic sound, you know? And they had these in cars, you know, the two front speakers, the two back speakers, you know? 
And you could hear something out of each speaker, and it was like, wow, you heard the drums over here, and the bass over here, and the voice over here, and it just came at you from all angles, and it's still basic concepts of music today. And I believe that this is what God has given us in these four things. And the question is, are you listening? So many of the painful mistakes that we make could just be avoided if we just go through these four things. <laughs> just find out, what does the Word say? Is this consistent with God's will for my life? Is this where the Holy Spirit's leading me? Is this what my church would advise me to do? We can avoid a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow if we would just listen to these four speakers into our life. The second title is, He's the Mighty God. The Mighty God. For those who say Jesus is not God, I wonder what Bible are you reading? Here it is in black and white, or in this case purple, that Jesus is the Mighty God. Um, The word mighty here means warrior. Okay, when it, re- it refers to in the Old Testament, these several scriptures like this, it's like, for example, in Joshua chapter 10, it says that Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war, all the soldiers with him, and all the mighty men of valor. In other words, all the generals and all, all the lieutenants, all the guys who were just known for being mighty warriors. This is the same word that describes God in this passage, Jesus, the mighty God. Everybody loves a hero. Movies are about heroes. We, those are the ones that sell out. And, and we love to watch heroes. In fact, here's the top 10 movie heroes from, from the past several decades. See if you can name who's who. Who's this? Zorro, right? He's number 10. And then who's this? Batman, okay. And then... What's his name? Jack, right? Fictional character, right? Who's this? Yeah, Claude Van Damme. Um, who's this? Spartacus, right, yes, good, good for you. This is probably the most popular in my childhood. Indiana Jones, right? And then uh, Die Hard, the Christmas movie, right? What's his name in the movie? Trump. George McClain, good job, Patrick. And John McClain. And then uh, Braveheart, William Wallace. I love this one because it's a true story. Um, great history lesson there. And then uh, number two, fi- fictional character, Eric Gordon from Lord of the Rings. Anybody want to guess who number one is? Good guesses, but um, from the 500, yeah. It's Google. It has to be true, right? Okay. Yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> this is not, I didn't make it up, okay? Man. And there was a riot in church Sunday because Gary's list is bad. <laughs> but none of these compare to, to Jesus. The, the same word is used of David of being a mighty warrior, and it says that the Philistines sent out their champion. Their, the, the same word here for mighty warrior. They sent out their champion, and of course, what do we send out? A teenager with a sling, but he wins, and he conquers. And this is the picture of Jesus. He is the mighty warrior, and it doesn't say he'll become that later in life. He's born that way, and so he would grow up to be our champion. He'd be our hero. He'd be our warrior. He'd be the one who would take on the ultimate enemy, not the Philistines, not the Soviets, not, you know, um, any of one of Spider-Man's enemies or Marvel enemies, if you want to go there, okay? He would take on the ultimate enemy, sin and death, and he would win, and he'd be victorious. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, it says he's the mighty God, not almighty, and they try to make a distinction between almighty and mighty. They say Jesus is uh, the Son of God only, and therefore he's called mighty God, and God the Father is called the almighty God. That's not even biblical. That's not even true. Here in, in, uh, in Psalm 50, it's talking about Jehovah. It says, the mighty God, even the Lord, Jehovah, has spoken. So there Jehovah is called the mighty God, not just almighty. And you see the titles are interchangeable. Um, it also says in Jeremiah, you show steadfast love to thousands, O great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord. When you see the Lord in all uppercase, it means Jehovah. So that, that totally disproves their theory on that. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is speaking here to the church. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Isaiah says that Jehovah is the beginning and Jesus says, I am the beginning and the end. That's why, because they're one and the same. There's not a God and then lesser God. And it says, who was and is and who is to come, 
the Almighty. Jesus calls himself the Almighty. So if you hear Jehovah's Witness knock at your door and they try to tell you this stuff, it's not even close to biblical. So the whole idea of Jesus being the mighty God, in Job, it says, behold, God is mighty. Again, think of it in a warrior and in a military context. He despises not any, and he is mighty in strength and wisdom. So just as powerful as he is in battle, he's also powerful in his wisdom. What battle are you in right now that you need to trust your mighty warrior God to fight for you? Think about that. What are you going through right now that is your biggest battle? This is where you need God to fight for you. you we, we try to fight on our own. And God says, I'm willing to fight for you. Back to our passage, the third title, Everlasting Father. Now this one can be confusing because, well, wait, Jesus is God the Son and there's God the Father. It's not saying that Jesus is the same in that sense. He, they're all God. We believe in one God, not three. One God who, who uh, demonstrates himself eternally as three persons, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But here it's saying the Messiah, Jesus, would be fatherly forever. In other words, he's the one father of like creation. Just like Colossians 1 says, Jesus spoke the world into existence. He's the father in that sense, and he'd be that everlasting father. And probably one of the best commentaries in all the Bible of what a father should be like is from Psalm 103. It says, as a father shows compassion. Everybody say compassion. Isn't that what you think of when you think of Jesus? Doesn't Jesus show compassion? Show compassion to his children so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. We see this spelled out in the Gospels. In Matthew, it says, when he saw the crowds, Jesus had what? Compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so the fatherly instinct of Jesus, even though he had no biological children, he saw Israel and us as his children, and he had compassion. Um, How many times is compassion mentioned in the Gospels? Seven times. Not surprising there. Um, in, and then the last title, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Jesus said in John 14, interesting statement here. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He's talking about two different kinds of peace. There is a peace that he leaves, and there is also a peace that gives. The leave is a one-time thing. This is bought and paid for. And then give is in the perpetual sense of, I will continually give this to you. And what, scripture bears this out. Watch here what Romans says. Therefore, we have been justified by faith. We have what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when Jesus died on the cross and he took our penalty, he took, out the, took away the sin that was separating us and God and he brought us and God back together so that we were no longer at war with God, but we had peace with God. But then there's the other type of peace that Jesus mentioned is the peace of God. And he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will, will guard future tense, an ongoing sense, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So when you get saved, when you become born again, when you go through that transformation from lost to saved, from darkness to light, you have peace with God. But now to go through your life, you need the peace of God. When you make decisions, you can, sometimes you can say, well, I just don't have a peace about that. We're not talking about a feeling. We're talking about a confidence that God, through the Holy Spirit, gives us. Like Colossians 3 says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So the ruler, the word rule there, I mean, we, the Greek word is umpiro, where we get our word umpire. So for your baseball fans, you know, that's the guy who says it's, something is safe. Or it's out. It's either fair or it's foul. The Holy Spirit of God, through peace, calls the shots and tells you what you can and can't do. And that is what guards our hearts from being just stressed out on making all these decisions on our own. That's the peace of God. So I'm just interested in knowing this morning, have you experienced peace with God? Has the sin that you committed against him and the penalty that you should pay been paid for by Christ? and therefore making you and God right with one another. Isaiah 53 says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. In other words, all the crimes we've committed. He was crushed for our iniquities or our sins. And upon him, watch this, was the chastisement or the discipline. So he took the discipline, the chastisement that brought us peace. See, Christ really is the Prince of Peace because he died on the cross so that you could be at peace with God. 
and it says that with his wounds, we are healed. Luke 179 says, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Before you knew Christ, you were in darkness. And Christ came into the world through the baby Jesus Christ. He lived the perfect life. He died the death that you and I should have died. And he took our place on that cross. Not only did he do that, he took all those sins. Think of all the things you've ever done. You say, okay, I try really hard to forget. But think about the bad things you've ever done. He took all of those and he buried them. And he was there for three days. And on the third day, what happened? He rose again. You see, the baby born was born to die. And 33 years later, he did just that for you and for me. I don't have a microphone. Anyway, that's what brought us peace. Do you know peace? Do you know Jesus Christ? Uh, the scripture goes on to say in chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you've not made that decision, if you never trusted Christ as Lord, see a lot of people when they're young, they pray a prayer and they think, oh, I'm saved. But then they never made Jesus Lord of their life. That's not a genuine decision. You see, it's two sides of the same coin. You accept Christ as Savior and you live for him. And at that moment, when you make that decision to make him Lord of all because he gave everything for you. Then you're born again, you're saved. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much for the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Lord, we celebrate so much more than just a baby in a manger. We celebrate the one who lived the perfect life and died an amazing, loving sacrifice just for us. We're so thankful. Father, I pray if there's one here today who's not genuinely trusted you as Lord and Savior, that they would do so today. They'd give their life to you because you gave everything for them. Thank you for this time to celebrate as a church family, and we pray that we continue to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are... Uh, if you want to know more information about becoming a Christian, or if maybe you made that decision today, let me know. There's my cell phone number. You can call me or text me anytime. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we enter into the candlelight portion of our service. Would you read Isaiah 9, verse 2 with me? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has the light shone. And that's what the birth of Christ is about, that light has entered into a very dark world. The Bible also says that when Christ comes the second time, he will do the same thing. Our world is getting very dark, isn't it? You can see the darkness spreading all around, and yet Christ will enter again. He entered the world the first time as a suffering Savior, but when he enters the second time, it will be as a conquering King. So we're going to sing about that holy night together.
Merry Christmas.